All right. Welcome to another episode of Comic Book Squares. We just want to remind everybody about our big contest for 2023. We're going to help find a new writer in comic books. We're partnered with Dream Foundry on this. And uh, just remember, the deadline is the end of September to get your uh, stories in. So to kick the show off, my name's Shane. I'm Paul. I'm Ben. And I'm Mike. Let's get this show started. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Comic Book Squares. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, As you heard Shane mention in the opening there, uh, we do have our comic script writing contest uh, that we're sponsoring through Dream Foundry coming up. So uh, don't forget to uh, check the show notes in the description to learn more about that. Today we're excited to have uh, an awesome guest here, Richard Fairgray. We're going to be talking about his uh, upcoming comic book, uh, sorry, it's uh, Haunted Hill. And uh, we're excited to talk about that today. Richard, uh, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself and about this uh, this book. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm Richard. I'm the writer and artist on Haunted Hill and about 270 other books at this point. Um, and I, I actually, that's not true. Actually, I keep saying 270 other books. And the other day I did an actual uh, a double check on my list of like every published title I have. Yeah. And I realized that on my spreadsheet, I counted uh, one of my series twice. So it's actually just a little over 250, which is uh, very upsetting because I'm, I just turned 38 and I had this whole idea of like, what if I could do uh, 300 books by the time I turn 40? And now I don't think I can, uh, unless I can like crank out a massive amount of other stuff or like just like appear in a lot of anthologies. But I still, I even think that would be pushing it. Yeah. Anyway, um, Haunted Hill is one of the nine books I have coming out this year. <laughs> uh, it is about... Uh, it's, it's a surrealist soap opera about life in Hollywood. Uh, it follows Eva, who is a 35-year-old sloppy dirtbag who has moved back to Hollywood after her wife gets a really good museum job. It's the kind of museum job that women her age don't usually get, but because so many old white men have been being arrested for dressing up as monsters lately, there's some openings. So what Haunted Hill does is it takes, like, kid logic and applies adult human emotion. Um... You know, people say Hollywood is the place where dreams come to die, and I feel like that's kind of the reason. So it's a place where, uh, you know, passwords on your treehouse work. If you don't look down, you won't fall. But at the same time, like, people are going to react to you and be honest with you about the bullshit that you're pulling. And what I'm trying to explore with, with Eva is, like, she is, like, there's this magical place that I've discovered as I get older, as a, as a, 30, as a 38-year-old overweight gay man where uh, you reach a certain age and weight. And if you were a woman or a gay man, you become invisible in Los Angeles. And for many Mm. people, that's very bad. But for some people, it can become like a superpower because you are invisible enough to call people on their bullshit and never have to address your own problematic behaviors. (laughs) And that is what Eva is doing. She just kind of problematizes your way through every moment in pseudo real time. Yeah, I was... Uh, you know, got a chance to, cause you sent us some of the, the preview copies and stuff. We got a chance to read through it and it was, it was pretty funny and, and the surrealism and the, the humor, uh, were just really, really fun. So, um, you know, it, I, you didn't talk about it in the, and I don't know if it's giving anything away, but her job, Eva's job. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, see, this I, is, I, this is one of these weird things where like, so I did a Kickstarter earlier in the year for my uh, my memoir, Octopus. And yeah. in that book, I am very open about like the big sloppy adventures that I tend to have. I love sex clubs, especially ones that have senior discount days, because I love sex with old men. <laughs> so it's a very ordinary part of my day to day. Now, I was originally going to put uh, Haunted Hill on Kickstarter first, and I felt like I was going to have to do a lot of explanation of like, okay, so there are these places called there's a place called Slammer, and in Haunted Hill it's called Slam Town, but it's Slammer, let's be honest. And they have Senior <laughs> Discount Sunday, and basically it's like a maze made of shipping containers where you pay money and you go in and you fuck. And it's great. But then I put out the Octopus book, and I was like, I'm never going to have to explain this again, because I forget that actually the way the world works is people won't have read Octopus, because also <laughs> like I said, like, I fulfilled that campaign a week ago. Um, <laughs> so, yes, uh, Eva works as the daytime janitor at uh, Slamtown, uh, which is a 
sex club. Uh, uh, there, it, it, in the book, I fictionalize it a little, but it's you know it's it's a maze with some some private rooms and some. Uh, it, 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 it's big claim to fame is it has the longest suckatorium in Southern California. A suckatorium is like a long wall of glory holes, and what separates Slam Town from other places is that there's a split level, so the people getting sucked can walk up a ramp and be higher up. So the guys doing the sucking are like on their feet, which is really good because Slam Town is one of the only uh, like fully clothed sex clubs, and you don't want to be on your knees if you're wearing pants because like the floor gets pretty gushy at a place like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, necessity is the mother of invention, I guess. <laughs> and comfort. I mean, you know, if you have yeah. a senior discount, you know, who's going to want to have to, like, try to get up off of their knees you know, when you get to be a certain uh, age, you know? Well, it's like, like my, my husband blew out his knee last year, and he's he's 77. Uh, and, like, my God, like, everything we did was lying down for until he got his operation. <laughs> See? See? So, he, yeah, so I mean, you have to, you know, like you said, in a uh, <laughs> some other yeah, invention there. You know, it, it seems like I'm just being like filthy for the sake of it, but like when, um, you know, I started in Haunted Hill because I, I, uh, I was living in Hollywood. It's my favorite place in the world, and then I moved to Canada during COVID because uh, my husband and I, like, he lives here, I live down there, and then we oh, jump back okay. and forth every two weeks. And then when COVID hit, we got separated for several months, and I was like, well, this is quite terrible. So I came up to Canada full time and uh, kind of got stuck here and I was missing Hollywood so much. So I started making this book about, all, you know, essentially like, what are my favorite places? How can I incorporate them? Yeah. And uh, I wasn't going to include this, this particular sex club, but like one, I think it's really funny that she's the daytime janitor when it's closed. Um, you know, Eva is, a, is a, <laughs> she's, she's, she's a, she's a difficult person. I love her dearly. She's like, yeah. <laughs> She's sort of like if me and my best friend went down a slide too fast together, but um, <laughs> her her approach to life, like she views it as uh, she's very she's very proud of herself for having a working class job because her wife earns enough money that she doesn't need to worry about having a well paid <laughs> job. So like you understand the complicated acrobatics she's doing in her own mind to justify that one. Uh, and then on top of that, she does consider cleaning up gay men's jizz to be a feminist action because it was never going to be weaponized against women anyway. Right. <laughs> but so when I was um, when I was up here, I was trying to explain the the place that it's based on to someone, and uh, I looked up there, like you know, obviously they're on Twitter, and you can see some of the nastiest stuff imaginable of people just using their real names, just balls to the wall and through the hole in that wall <laughs> on Twitter talking about what they're going to do there. But like, if you go on Yelp and you read about this place, it is like, and this might've just been an early COVID thing where people were like feeling a bit sad and vulnerable, but like every yeah. single review was like, this place is so important. It's the only place where I feel seen. It's the only place where I can feel loved. I miss it so much. I will be hanging around outside it if anyone wants to just fuck behind it or something. Like, it, <laughs> but it was it was so heartfelt. I was like, I have to include this. Like this, yeah. It's a, it's a special magical. <laughs> and what's weird is like like other than like page one, she comes out of the job interview. She will end up going to work there later in the series. But like, in this oh, point, yeah. <laughs> other than being the sexy variant cover, it's actually really not present at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, okay. So talking about some of your, um, you know, real life experiences is based, you know, it's based on a real place and stuff. One thing I was noticing, I, I loved uh, your writing with the dialogue, especially it just felt so real, like the interrupting and the ums and us and the, and it, it just, it really felt like you were, like you said, like a soap, you're watching in on this conversation of these people. Um, do you, how, like, does some of this come from real convos, I, you know, without giving names or anything, like real convos that you've had or, 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 or what have you, or how does that come about? Cause, um, you know, I noticed that in Octopus too. I mean, and that was, you know, based on, you know, as, as autobiographical, yeah. um, but is this like some of these convos based on that or just, uh, am I just that impressed with your, <laughs> with your dialogue I'm, writing? I'm, I'm just that good. Um, no, uh, <laughs> there was, it, it's, it's a bit of a mix. Like, um, the actual events of the first book, so it's 
Eva, because she, like, her Uber cancels on her because she has a very low star rating, which you understand when you get to know the character. Um, <laughs> and her phone's at 2%, so she has to get a ride home with some people in their 20s. And when you get in a car with people in their 20s, like, a 10-minute ride turns into, like, an all-night adventure because, you know, drama. And, um, <laughs> and, and like, so it just it's this kind of big, shaggy dog story as, as they, like, ramble their way through Hollywood from one place to another, and, and like, things keep coming up. And that is loosely based on uh, actually two nights before the first lockdown. Um, I was walking home, and uh, my 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 office in Hollywood, and it's about a fifteen minute walk south to my house. And a car pulls up behind me and says, "Hey, Mark." And I went, "Yeah." And I jumped in the car, and they said, "You're not Mark." And I was like, "That's absolutely true. What are we doing?" And (laughs) they were going to. Um, they had to go and break into this person's house because he'd made a sex tape of their friend without telling her. And I was like, that sounds like a great adventure. I'm 100% on board. And of course, it turned into this all night thing where like, like it's different in Haunted Hill. Like in real life, we broke into like a tire yard and then I had to teach these fucking children how to break into a house because they didn't know how to. And then because I'm very old, I thought we were going to like get the one and only copy of the tape and destroy it. But it turns out we were just there to trash the place. And I was like, this is a much bigger crime than I signed on for. And it's like 4 a.m. now. Um, so I like, I was like, I'd dip out of that real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so like, like little bits of it are from that. Um, there are, you know, when I first moved to Hollywood, uh, I made friends with, you know how when you move to a new town, you just make friends with the first people you see. And you're like, we're going to be friends forever. This is amazing. It's like, <laughs> Like manic yeah. high for the first month, and then you're like, "Oh, you guys are really problematic and shit." <laughs> um, yeah. And so I, I, I had this sort of group of friends. It was my first group of like straight boys who were friends with me, and it was like real little rascal shit. Like they all had names that sounded made up, but then unfortunately <laughs> turned out to be real. Um, <laughs> you know, and 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 then they had like a there was one there was a guy who was he was he was dating a girl for the eight months I knew him. And her name was Minnie. And it turns out he just didn't know her real name, but remembered that she was from Minneapolis and she thought it was a cute nickname. I was like, this, (laughs) hey, man, this, this actually sucks. Like, (laughs) this is quite dehumanizing. And he's like, I don't see how. I was like, that's because you're terrible. Um, You know, and there was, there was an awful lot of like bits like that that would come through. Uh, The character of Keith, is uh, a kind of a conglomerate of about four different guys who I met during that period. Um, the Sasha and Hudson are sort of, you know, a mix of a couple of other people, but like, yeah, there are, the, the dialogue is, is, you know, cut from whole cloth, but the inspiration behind it is very much real. Um, there's yeah. a, yeah, there's, look, there's a lot of shitty people. And like, I, I don't want, I don't want to do a like Tim from the office thing where like, he's the only sane one amongst us bullshit. Cause like that's <laughs> tired. Um, yeah. but I, I want to be like, here's my deeply flawed, unpleasant character. Here are some deeply flawed, unpleasant characters for very different reasons. And the fun shit that happens when the two of these things collide is going to create very good comedy. And you'll be yeah. on Eva's side, but you'll also be on everyone else's side. And they're like, Eva, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I uh you know it's funny you say that because I caught that feeling like wholeheartedly at the conclusion of episode or uh, issue one you know mm-hmm. when, when they're telling her basically to shut the fuck up <laughs> but then she's like yeah but I'm not 40 you know yeah, the, the, the only thing she's upset about is that they refer to her as being 40 years old yeah. like, they called her out of college and she's like I'm not 40 it's like yeah I'm I know but you still you still <laughs> You you don't you've known these people for five minutes. Maybe don't interrupt their like fight. You don't know what it's about. Right, right. <laughs> no, I love that, and I, I, you know, I love characters that are like Eva, like that aren't one hundred percent, you know, black and white. And especially, it, it's they lend themselves to stories like this, which are you know more grounded, you know, uh, more realistic. Um, it, but even so, there's so many writers who still want to make their characters i don't know all completely altruistic or completely mm-hmm. this or completely that and i love the complexity with with ava's character it it lends itself to some i oh, already it lends itself to some great comedy but i could see it lending itself to like it, as it gets crazier through this 
time with these tw- <laughs> these twenty somethings. I could see it getting a little more wild with her. Yeah, <laughs> with I, her. I really I want to capture like that energy of just trying to make a good impression, trying to keep up, not being able to like hold back from calling people on their bullshit because you're tired. And yeah. like Eva is someone who is um. There's these, there's these, my favorite moments with Eva are always where she is apologizing uh, for existing, you know, which is something I do pretty regularly. Um, and just trying to like, and, and then like there'll be this little switch that will happen where like she'll she'll figure out one thing someone else has done wrong and be like, oh, I know who I am now. Sorry. Here's why you fucking suck. And like she will just like destroy them or at least like maybe not destroy like she'll feel like she's she'll feel powerful she'll call them out and they're terrible from the time she'll go away from feeling like i have won this situation because i was technically yeah. right it doesn't matter that i was also terrible <laughs> oh man you know, I, I, I think when when um i know that it's like a i know that like say lena dunham is a deeply difficult person to like um but when the show Girls started, I was the age of those main characters. And so we're all over oh, like a couple of years older than all the main characters in that show. And I remember yeah. watching it thinking like, oh, this is a very funny show because I can see all of the terrible behaviors of my friends. In this. And then I would talk to my friends about it and they'd be like, this show's great. These people seem amazing. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you're, you're missing the bit that is like, 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 and like, don't get me wrong. The, the 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 moment where 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 um, Hannah says, uh, "I just I'm like everyone else. I feel like I just have two really good folk albums in me." I'm like, "Yeah, I feel that. Like I believe that about myself. <laughs> like I am an asshole, but like I can also see when someone's making fun of me for the asshole that I'm being." Right. <laughs> I, I, I tried. I think like one of the things I wanted to capture with Haunted Hill was like, you know, it's it's everyone who everyone who watched girls when it was on TV and thought they related to the characters should now be old enough to realize that they shouldn't want to be like those characters. And I'm hoping that haunted Hill can replace that for them. <laughs> right. Yeah. That is funny how people uh, sometimes end up romanticizing characters. Because, mm. I don't know, like, you know, that they necessarily maybe shouldn't, uh, but it, yeah. you know, in the moment you're caught up because of the, the, you know, zeitgeist. I don't know. Like, you know, everybody's into it, and it's like the thing. And then you romanticize these characters, and you come back to it later, and you're like, <laughs> well, it's, it's like when you, when you see someone who's like they've just seen Clockwork Orange for the first time, and they're like, man, he sure showed them. Their like reprogramming didn't work on him. Man, he's the coolest. And then I got a T-shirt with his face on it. Like, do you remember the bit where he was like a rapist? Though? Like, do you remember? Right. Like. Or, or like people who are like, man, Tyler Durden is the coolest character ever. I want to be just like him. I really learned lessons from Fight Club. You learned the wrong ones. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, and that's those ones, you know, so being a, uh, you know, cis straight white male myself, mm-hmm. um, you know, I read Fight Club and saw the movie and was like, oh my gosh, this is like so great. Da, da, da. And then, you know, I, I'll be honest, uh, you know, at the point didn't sink in until a couple of few years later. Mm-hmm. And I was just reading more of Palinic stuff. And then I was like, and then I was starting to get it, you know, which mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. I wasn't trying to be Tyler Durden, like, you know, call everybody snowflakes and, <laughs> and all that. But I'm saying like, I got caught up in that, like the masculinity of it. Right. Or mm-hmm. whatever of the Durdenisms. Um, yeah. And then you come to realize that it was this whole statement about how toxic that yeah. is and how toxic and how lost those people are so it i'm sorry no, i'm going off topic but but you no, know it's, it's a stick with that romanticizing yeah so. it's, it's completely like i think it's a really natural thing to do that, like we we relate to i mean i i would i would wager that if every Kirby enthusiasm fan was really honest with themselves they want to think they're larry you know <laughs> And right. you know who you don't want to hang out with is Larry David. Like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's great in real life, but can you imagine having to no. hang out with? Him? But sure, he's like he's funny and he's technically correct, and oh, he's saying things as they really are. And like, I mean, he's also like he's worth what four hundred million dollars and having a big cry right. about how difficult his life is. Oh, I'm so sorry you don't fit in in LA and you had to return your pants one time. Like, <laughs> right. 
That's so relatable. <laughs> Four hundred million dollars. And this is a, a big part of like with Hard Hill. I think I think that a lot of people have this like this idealized view of Hollywood. They think of it as either a terrible place full of tourists, which it is, or they think of it as like a very fancy place where films get made and magic happens, which it is. Yeah. But it's also like a place populated largely by very ordinary people who don't work in the film industry, who work near the film industry and have to like overhear a lot of people talking in cafes about what they're writing. Um, but like, we're, we're just struggling to get by. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people there who are just, may, I mean, sure, maybe they're making their living dressing up as a transformer or carrying a snake around, but maybe they're just like living in a really predatory neighborhood where like rent is four and a half thousand dollars because you have no credit score and you're living in a one bedroom. And the thing is like, that is terrible. But what makes it worthwhile is that this sheer impossibility of the energy of that place means it's like, it's, it's just worth being near. You know, like I, 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 I talk about Hollywood as being like the place where I could walk from my house to my office without having to look up just purely based on the like different piss smells on the way there. <laughs> like it's, it's the place where, like, like, there's, there's a, there's a homeless guy on Sunset Boulevard um, who I'd walk past every day on the way to work who looked exactly like Willie Nelson. And uh, he has his, his Instagram hashtag was Sunset Willie. Everyone calls him Willie. Uh, I'd talk to him, you know, for a few, I learned the lesson. Like he's, he was, you know, a five minute conversation is great, but you go beyond that. It's going to get into some pretty like heavy conspiracy theories or weird racism, but like, not oh. like, yeah. not like the almost fascinating racism where it's like, it's like, Oh, these are, these are stereotypes I've never heard before. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know where these ones come from. <laughs> um, but uh, you, you, you I, t I talked to him every day and he was a big like comic fan. It turns out. So I would like give him my comics and it's talk and chat. And, and then, one day uh, I was walking, walking to work and I see Willie and he's like covered head to toe in gold, just gold jewelry everywhere. And I said, Willie, what, what's going on? And he said, oh, Richard, you know, I, um, I want to see Stevie Wonder and you know, he got his vision back. And turns out now that he can see it, hates the gold, thinks it's awful, thinks it's tacky. I was like, well, you know what, Stevie, I'll take it. So here I am. I was like, Willie, I don't want to hear anything else. Like... <laughs> I don't, I don't, like, that's the best version of that story that can exist. And the truth is, like, Willie believes it. But also, right. he had the gold, which means there is a universe where it's possible that Stevie Wonder did, in fact, get his vision back and develop a distaste for gold jewelry and gave it all to his friend, Sunset <laughs> Willie. And that delights me. Yeah, Schrodinger's Stevie, yeah. <laughs> and you, you, don't, you don't get stuff like that. Like, Hollywood is so specific for the fact that you can, like, I mean, my my office is in the world's first shopping mall, and it turns out that the room that I am in was also a secret gay brothel in the 1950s, and uh, like, there's also like, like when I moved in, I had to carry a, a bunch of boxes of books up this up the stairs. And I was moving in on the weekend, and this like group of guys came over and they're like, "Oh, what are you doing?" I was like, "Moving in." They're like, "Oh, can we help?" I was like, "Sure." And they're helping me carry all these boxes up. And I was like, "This is great." And I was like, "What do you guys do?" And they're like, "Oh, we just..." We're just back here recording. It's the 25th anniversary of a song we did, so we're uh, we're just re-recording a new version of it. Oh, that's really cool. What's the song? And like, oh, you know, Gangsta's Paradise. I'm like, okay, so so Coolio and the rest of his crew are helping me carry boxes of children's books up some stairs because they were on a break. And like, but also Sunset Willie's out there, and also there's this weird fish in the courtyard in this like fountain that that is the ugliest, dumbest fish in the world that I'm deeply, deeply obsessed with. Um, but every time I see it, I look at it and I go, I bet someone's fucked that fish. It's got a real gay of mouth. And everyone says, no, Richard, no one's ever fucked that fish. And then one day I come to my office at 2 a.m. and there's someone in there fucking that fish. And I was right. So I sat and watched him the whole time. And he said to me, what are you looking at? I was like, you don't get to ask me what I'm doing right now. Like, you're fucking that fish in the mouth. <laughs> the <Never>. next day. <laughs> They were upset uh, at you. <laughs> I thought it was in here. I, I, I've got a, I've got a beautiful photograph of the fish um, that I took the morning after. It's the first time I'd ever seen it with no cobwebs in its mouth, um, but it's it's obviously in a different room, so I can't show it to you. Oh yeah, but it's it, it's it's the cover of um of of chapter two of Hard Hill. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's the fish. That's the fish. I try and get oh, into everything I do now. <laughs>
<laughs> That's an amazing story. Oh my gosh. Now, now I'm going to be looking out. You said you've tried to put it in uh, other things that you've done. It's I'm the, sure. it's the kind of, it's the MacGuffin of shed. Um, it doesn't appear in octopus anywhere because the octopus is all set before I knew the fish. Um, so I knew the fish. I, I named it as a fish list. Um, but yeah, no, I, I try and I try and like just work in some kind of fish, some kind of fish with a real gaper of a mouth, some kind of ugly fish into every story. <laughs> I'm gonna have to keep an eye out for that. If you follow uh, me on Twitter, you'll see a lot of selfies of me with that fish. <laughs> So, uh, okay. So a, a moment ago, uh, when you were talking about your books and stuff, and you're moving up to that office, you had said, you know, boxes full of children's books. Is that where you got started with uh, this writing and, and il illustrating, or um, was it comics first? Or I kind of how did you get into this whole scene anyway? Um, so I I have a weird past. Um, my parents. <laughs> firmly believed that if I couldn't read and write by the time I started kindergarten, then I would be behind everyone else. In New Zealand, you start kindergarten at four. So uh -huh. at three, I was able to read and write, and I decided that I should start making my own books. I ended up starting kindergarten early, and uh, just because like my birthday's in April, the start of the school year is February, so they're like, go along now. Have a full year of eating Play-Doh or whatever. <laughs> and so I had just made this book uh, and I, what I used to do is I would, I would take pieces of paper together and then be like, my book is going to be this long. Um, and I made this book called Donald Duck and the Haunted House. And it was about Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse were meant to go to a haunted house together. And Mickey doesn't show up. So Donald goes in on his own. He gets to the attic and there's a ghost. And the ghost is sad because he has no friends. And Donald says, I thought I had a friend, but I don't. And then Donald takes out a gun and shoots himself in the face so that he can stay there as a ghost and be friends with the ghost forever. <laughs> and so day one of kindergarten, my parents get called in and everyone's worried about me. And I'm like, this is so much attention. Like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> I get this for writing stories. And then, uh, and by the way, there were no pictures in this book. And then uh, okay. shortly after that, it was Valentine's Day. We were told, Draw a picture of some people who are in love, which is a fucked up project to give kids, but whatever. <laughs> Everyone else draws their parents. I draw Postman Pat and Reverend Tims from the show Postman Pat, because in every episode, he goes to visit the Reverend first thing in the morning. I assumed they loved each other very much. Also, by this point, I'd already developed my fascination with old men. Uh, um, okay. And so I just drew them kissing, and I got in all this trouble again. And I was like... This is amazing. If I can draw pictures and write things and get in trouble for, I like doing both of those activities. And I'm gonna get like everyone's talking. This is fucking fantastic. So I just kept, making books, kept getting in trouble, and then uh, and then I realized that like uh, I had like, I'd seen comics in TV shows and in movies and stuff, and like you know Michelangelo reads comics, Bart Simpson reads comics, but I'd never seen one in real life. And so I thought, I bet that's because animation exists. So there's no point in having still images anymore, which means that no one in the world makes comics. So if I make comics, I'll be the only person. And then I can probably become a millionaire really easily. I was <laughs> determined to become a millionaire. Like it was just, that was my only focus. When I first got MS Paint, all I would do is like try and accurately recreate posters I'd seen for different lotteries. Huh. Like I was just all the, the signs would say like win three million dollars. Well, I wouldn't like to have a picture of that actually. Yeah, that seems really important to me. I'd sit, sit there <laughs> pixel by pixel trying to create like three D numbers. Um, and so I made this book called Ghost Ghost about a ghost who uh, was sad because he was invisible, so no one was scared of him. So he had to get a ghost costume. And I was blackmailing my school library, and this was back around seven. And I got free photocopying through that. And so then I was able to sell it at a school athletics day and buy like a buttload of Power Rangers toys, which is pretty sick, you know? And, um, you know, so like, like I went from having like, I literally had one Power Ranger suddenly being like, I've got Megazord, I've got Dragonzord, I've got Titanus, I've got like all six of the Rangers. I even had a Goldar. No one wants Goldar. Like, <laughs> like my, my plan was to buy, I wanted to buy like 10 Putty. So that I could just have all the putty around them, be like, hey, it's just like in the show when they all appear all at once. There was no big <laughs> repulsa action figure in that line, by the way, which I was very upset about because I loved her. Um, yeah, she might be the only kind of obvious gay stereotype, uh, like like uh, 
like powerful woman character that everyone thinks of like fondly now that I actually liked. Yeah. Um, I, I never, I never fell into the obvious ones. I always just liked the grumpy old men. Um, anyway, so, so I had like all that. So I started making comics, kept making comics, um, was like, fo- like getting free photocopying through elementary school. And then in middle school, I had to start paying for the photocopying myself. And then I was just selling yeah. these things at like school athletics days and little markets and like just out of my backpack. And then through high school, I mostly started doing crime because it like, it was just easier and like had a broader audience. Like more people want to buy cigarettes and alcohol and drugs than want to buy comics. So like <laughs> that just, you know, but I kept making the comics. Yeah. And then uh, I was working as a stand up comedian uh, briefly in high school and I was able to like, I was on TV a few times. So I was able to turn that into like some opportunities to get like endorsements and sponsorship deals. And suddenly my comics had money behind them. And then I started doing like proper print runs and selling at conventions by the time I got to college, I was putting out a couple of graphic novels each year and like making enough from that that I didn't have to have any kind of part time job. And I just do these six conventions a year. And like, you know, it, it's college. It's not really, you don't need real money. You can have like, oh, I've got $11 this week. I guess I'm going to buy two pizzas <laughs> one piece a day. Right. right. But, um, you know, like it was, it was, it, it all kind of worked. And then by the time I finished college, uh, my plan was I'll quit comics, I'll, I'll do my 100th book. It'll be this like big final thing. And then I will uh, become a high school teacher and be miserable like all the adults I know. <laughs> and then uh, I kind of had a bit of like a nervous breakdown over th- this possibility. And I'd saved up about a quarter of a million dollars from like just doing all of these shows. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to fund a feature film about comic books because I know what people want. No one wants that. Yeah. Um, make this terrible film. Like, Good idea for a story, like a nice, quiet, introspective, whatever. Like, you know, it would make a nice graphic novel if I hadn't been 22. But we make this film, uh, and then I'm like, I will do, I'll work as a substitute teacher four days a week. I'll edit the film three days a week. And it was during that period where someone found that 100th book of mine on a film set and reached out to me and was like, hi, you don't know me. I like this book, blah, 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 blah. Their um, Gmail profile, like avatar, not avatar, but like their like their profile pic on Gmail, yeah. um, was their face, and I was like looking at them, man, that person's real familiar. Why are they so familiar? And I kind of blocked the top half of it. I was like, oh, from the neck down, I know that person from SilverDaddies.com. So I jump back on there and I find his username on there, and like we've been having like some of the like, best webcam sex I'd ever had. And I was like, hey, you like my comics as well as, you know, watch me put things in my butt. Um, we should, like, take this relationship a little further, maybe. Yeah. And long story longer, we fall deeply in love. He shows my books to a handful of people. Three of my books get optioned. I leave New Zealand, uh, move to Australia. Uh, like, I'm on the set of uh, a film that I won't say because I don't want to give away too many names of the people involved. Um, and, like suddenly everything seems like it's moving in the right direction and like i will never have to be a high school teacher of course it all falls apart because i'm 23 and he was secretly married um and then like the the everyone attached to this new company that was forming disappeared until it was just me and this like shitty producer who didn't really know what he was doing he'd just been like talking a big game and had a lot of good people attached um everything fell apart i got the rights back by scaring him with a scary lawyer um, who wasn't really even my lawyer. It was just some guy I met in an elevator. Uh, <laughs> and then like, but, but it was enough for me to go, Oh, I can do this for real. So I just went full time in comics, never became a high school teacher. Uh, and then I got into kids books because I was, um, I was going to a friend, like my, a friend's, uh, a friend of a friend had a kid and I was invited to some, I don't know if it was a baby shower or a, it was something like some, something to do with a child existing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, I will get this kid a copy of one of my favorite books. That's a nice gift. So I go along to the bookstore and like, they didn't have it, but also all of their children's books were wrapped in plastic and came with a toy. And I was like, okay, well, mm. if they're big fans of Laura Palmer, the wrapped in plastic thing is cool, but I don't think a lot of kids are really into that. <laughs> and I got really like bothered by the whole uh, mechanism of like, like we're taking away the fun part of holding books, right? So I went home, uh, didn't go to the baby shower or whatever it was, 
instead spent 24 hours writing and making uh, a picture book. And it was like incredibly rushed. And basically within three days, it had been like made, like written, drawn, colored, and sent off and ordered uh, 10,000 copies with absolutely no plan of what to do with it. I was just like, <laughs> I'm sure this will work. And then that week I had to go drop something off. Uh, my, my, one of my, like a boss at this other publisher had said, can you drop off some copies of this book to this place since you're in the right city to do it? I'm not sure. So I go take them along. And I'm like, what is this place? I'm like, oh, we're a book distributor. I was like, oh, cool. I do books. Would you like to distribute my children's book? And they were like, can we see it? I showed them some pictures on my iPad and they were like, oh, we'd love to. And then they ordered like 10,000 copies from me. I was like, that was easy. Okay. <laughs> that was much easier than comics. And so then. I started doing both, and I was like mostly doing like all ages comics. Like Blastosaurus was my big thing for a long time. It's a crime fighting dinosaur, you know. And yeah. and like I was I rebooted Ghost Ghost, and it was like I had ten mini comics of that out, you know. And so I ended up having like eleven children's books and all these kids books. And then I moved to America, and suddenly I'm getting like I'm working on three all ages series. One of them is monthly. The other two are one graphic novel a year each, and I'm just miserable. Like I'm excited by the work, but I'm like, I feel like I'm getting entirely pigeonholed and like I'm doing Blastosaurus now for like the 10th year or something. Mm -hmm. And so then when COVID hit, I was like, this seems like a real good time to change things. Um, and so I just started making a huge range of other stuff. And there were all of these like, like Haunted Hill happened literally because I finished one book and I had two days off before I started the next one. And I was just waiting on notes from an editor. So I wrote a six page short, drew it in the two days and then no notes came. So I just did the same thing again and again. And suddenly I had the first issue and then I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna do a book. And so the, the rule for it is always write six pages in the morning, do the layouts, draw six pages over two days, rinse and repeat until it's done. Um, and so, like that is that is how that one happened. Yeah. Uh, that is like Octopus happened in a similar way. Uh, my book Shed that came out through Blue Fox happened in a similar way. And then last year, all those kids books kind of came back. And suddenly, of course, like I'd signed on for other books by this point because they'd been delayed so long. I thought they were never coming back and I need money. Um, so I'd, I'd signed contracts with other publishers. And last year I went from having like, about 500 pages of art that I had to do to 980 pages of art that I had to do, oh, which is too gosh. much. Yeah. And so I just got really into Ritalin and like just worked 20 hour days, took no breaks throughout the entire year. And I got it done, but like, I didn't, I, I, I just kind of, I, I sort of like broke a little bit and I thought, I just not doing this anymore. And I, I want to do this adult stuff. And when I'd made Octopus, I'd shown it to my uh, my agent when I was about three chapters in, and she said, hey, Richard, if you ever show this to anyone, you'll lose your career. And then uh, I sat in it for like three years and didn't show anyone. And so then like deciding, fuck it, I'll just go all in, put Octopus out there. Everyone can know like the sloppy dirtbag that I am. Everyone can see my <laughs> flaws. Uh, and then I can do whatever the fuck I want. Um, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But at least I'll be happy making the things I'm making. Sorry, that was a really long answer for a very short question. No, 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 no. That's that was great. That was great. So okay, so in uh, in all of that, um, you know, writing the children's books and stuff. Um, do you are you looking for Disney to give you a call about that uh, Donald <laughs> Duck's uh, haunted mansion? <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah, I, I assume they will. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll tag them in this and then yeah, I'm sure I'll give it a call. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's strange. Like, I think there's a lot of people who really want to, um, like they get into comics because there are comics that they love. And I think that's really valid and really cool. And like, I totally understand why people are like, I want to write Spider-Man one day, or I want to draw Captain, whoever, I don't know, a, yeah. a comic, you know, a, a character that they've loved their whole life. For me, because I didn't read comics when I first started making them, I've never had that part of it. Um, oh, yeah. I actually, uh, like, I've made it, you know, 31 years of publishing without ever drawing anyone else's characters. And until, like, a week ago, when I got 
you know, convinced that I should do a piece for the um, Cthulhu Invades Neverlands anthology. Oh, yeah. And I was like, well, we'll see how it goes. And like, of course, I ended up writing a story about like, Toodles having lost his mind in the wilderness of Neverland long into the war, playing with marbles and like doing all of the dialogue for the scarecrows he's made to replace the dead lost boys. Uh, and confronting the fact that like his cowardice made him push the marble further and further away so he had an excuse to miss the battle. Um, but like it was, I, I, I didn't find the joy in it that I think I was meant to. And I think like, uh... um, you know, I'm I'm doing a cover for Nightmare Theater this year, which is going to be uh, Sam Dracula, who most people refer to as Grandpa Monster, but like he's Lily's father, not Herman, so he wouldn't have that last name. <laughs> um, but like, the, here's my stuffed toy of him. Um, oh my gosh, that's awesome! <laughs> it's for kiss and practice. Um, <laughs> but like, I'm doing a, I'm doing the sexy cover for that book with just him with his dick out. Um, so I guess that counts as fan art. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> You know, I, I've I've never kind of had that 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 part to it. So, like, if you know, when larger companies have called me and said, "Can we publish this book?" Uh, I I think maybe these are bad decisions. But like, I've turned down a lot of places when they've said, "We'd like to print this book that you already have out," or "We'd like you to like come in and talk about doing something else." Um, I don't I don't want to do that. Like, do I love a lot of those stories? Sure, but I love other people's interpretations of them. You know, everyone, this is the thing. Everyone has a favorite, like, Batman, right? Most people, yeah. it's like either Frank Miller or Bruce Timm. That's their favorite version of, of, of Batman. So if you're going to make it, you're either making, a, a, like, so you're, you know, your version of their version, or you're making something new, which means you're not doing the thing you wanted to do in the first place. Right. And I think that gets kind of, like, confusing for me. I think it's different if it's like a TV show, like, you know, would I want to write on Ninja Turtles? Sure. If it was the 2012 series, that sounds great. Um, but I think that one stopped being made. So they're probably not looking for anyone. Right. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's, there's all these like the complicated things around it. And I, I love making comics. I'm obsessed with it, but I can only really get obsessed with characters that I have made up because I know their backstories. I know who they are and I care about them as if they're my real friends. Yeah. No, no, I, <clears throat> I get that. I mean, I, I'm obviously not a comic book writer, uh, playwright, short story writer and stuff, but I've never, part of the reason, like if I ever did comics, I would want to do my own thing. I don't think I could ever like fully be excited about, I, Batman is my favorite character. That's the first comic. Yeah, I think I was like one of the first comics I got into, but I can never imagine trying to write it. I enjoy reading about Batman and all the different interpretations <laughs> and iterations and multiverses and all. I enjoy all that, but I, I I don't need to add my two cents to it because I have all these other stories and characters in my head who I much would rather talk about and control that, yeah. you know, instead of writing in that box. Do you feel like also too, that would be like constricting? Cause you're kind of boxed in on like their backstory and all there's like certain elements you can't change like fundamentally. Yeah. So then that would kind of box you in. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was, um, I remember I was, I was talking to my friend Dylan and he wrote, he wrote a uh, Batgirl for a while. And one of his like big complaints about it was that like, yeah, sure, he got to write Batgirl, but also, like, he had to go to the Bat Summit and a bunch of people sat around in a room, like, figuring out... I mean, actually, they sat around a whiteboard figuring out how they were going to kill Spoiler, I think. Um, mm. And But he, he said it was like, there's so little that you actually get to shape with the story. It's all sort of done by committee at that point. And I think that, like, th that has changed a lot. There are people who are given a lot more freedom. But I think that the kind of stories that I want to write... Um, I don't know if, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know if there's a, a place for that in a, within a bigger company. Someone asked me yeah. recently if I could do anything. I was, I was talking about the, um, uh, John Kent being bisexual. Um, yeah. and I said, like, I was saying, like, I think it's, it's neat, good for them. But I also think that, like, we're still at a point where you're not going to get to have, like, a lot of complexity to that, uh, representation because it's just amazing that we have it. Like we're, you know, 10 years ago, there was a tweet, I can't remember who tweeted it, but it's been 10 years and why would I? But they said like, oh cool, you've got a gay character. Have you figured out how you're gonna kill them yet? And that's a very good tweet. That's like, that. It, I wish it wasn't timeless, but like it feels timeless. We actually have moved on from that. We get to have gay characters who stay alive now, which is shocking. 
we don't get to have gay characters have complex relationships. Like Archie gets to date Betty and Veronica and like have trouble choosing. Yeah. John Kent is going to have one boyfriend from the beginning of his story and he's going to have that boyfriend forever. Like that is going to be it. You will never have John Kent single and out on the town getting a bunch of dicks. That's never going to happen. And every single character is going to be like super chill about him being openly bisexual now because like it's important to have those kind of stories. But you want to know what I would do if I got to write that character? I would have Jimmy Olsen be really homophobic. I would have incredibly bigoted Jimmy Olsen because why the fuck not? There's a lot of really homophobic people in the world and a lot of them are in our day-to-day lives. And wouldn't it be really interesting from a character perspective if Jimmy Olsen, someone that everyone else likes, was just saying some kind of low-key homophobic shit to John Kent or like making some little snide comments or just not wanting to be alone in a room with him? And John would have to say, hey, What's the deal with Jimmy? And everyone would be like, oh, no, he's my best friend. He's great. Now, Jimmy's yeah. a really cool guy. You just don't get him. And like that, that is the kind of complexity that you, you're you not going to get. It Like that, that's the kind of boxing in that I would have trouble with. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. I mean, it's, they do. And again, I'm, I, I can't, I, I'm only speaking from my, you know, cis straight, you know, thing, but I, I yeah, you do see them dilute that a lot in the comics. Like one thing I enjoyed about the CW shows, um, my kiddo um, is non-binary. So um, uh, they and I, like we, we watch the, you know, we watch all the comic book movies and shows and stuff together. And one thing I really appreciated about the CW DC shows is that they did add in some complexity. Like there was mm-hmm. in the Supergirl series um, when one of the, uh, one of the women um, who was finally decided she was gay, you know, got into this relationship, but then the woman she was dating broke it off with her because she was like, you're brand new to this. I've been out for a long time. And it was this whole yeah. thing that I, you know, again, coming from my straight background, I had no idea about, but it was, I'm glad my own kiddo got to see that, you know, as they identify as non-binary and they're, they're having their own questioning about other stuff. So, but just to be able to like, see the complexity of it. And it's not just like, Put a little neat bow on it, and it's like okay, everybody's you know everybody's happy in the whole universe. Yes, you're you're right. That was that that was a really great moment, and like TV can do a lot more. But and I could be misremembering that, but don't they then get back together like two episodes later because she's like, no, I've had a big think about it, and actually, I do want to be with you, even if I am new to this. No, I know they split. I thought, if I remember correctly, the cop was like gone for most of that or the rest of that season. I think she maybe oh, did, back. did she did she get together? She because she ends up with. With Jimmy's sister, right? I, I was I was a different person. I, 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 oh, yeah. She was with the cop at first. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah that, you're right. Yeah. Listen, that, that listen was... the, here, here's the secret about all gay representation. We're all actually the same person. So I, I'm oh. not wrong. I'm not wrong for confusing them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wish I would have known. That would have made everything so much easier. <laughs> no, yeah, when, 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 people, when people say all gays look alike, it's only one of us. It's, yeah, that's the, it's that's the secret. That is the secret. <laughs> I wish I would. I wish I would have known. That would, man, make it so much. I can get one gift from my friends every year. Then, so. <laughs> <laughs> this covers all the birthday, all the birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Hey Richard, I'm I'm gonna have to uh, to wrap it up here, but man, it was so awesome talking to you. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, before we do uh, head out, though, can you just share with uh, our listeners and viewers about where they can find um, your books that are already out and uh, give some more details on when and where they can get Haunted Hill? Right. So uh, Haunted Hill, I think by the time this episode comes out, will be the Kickstarter campaign will be live. Um, so go to kickrichard.com. And that'll take you straight to the campaign. Um, and there's, it's the book. It's got the gayest variant cover that anyone's ever done because everyone kept telling me, you got to put tits on your cover, Richard. And I was like, how about I put 29 dicks on it though? How about I do, <laughs> how about I just have Eva cleaning the floor at Slam Town and just a massive orgy happening around her instead of any tits anywhere. Um, <laughs> so kickrichard.com, you can get the book, the variant cover. I'm also doing a thing where for 50 bucks, you get the book and a page of the original pencils folded up and stuck inside the book. Oh, uh, wow. That's awesome. Cause I think it's, it's, it's very funny to be like, you want original art? Yes. It's folded up. So I don't have to pay more for shipping. 
<laughs> um, I'll have a bunch of other books as add-ons and things, including Octopus and Too Hot for Octopus, the sequel that I did, and like a few other bits and pieces. My kids' books are on Amazon. Um, a lot of my stuff is on richardfairgrade.com if you just want to read a bunch of comics for free. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of everything. I'm 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 the only Richard Fairgray in the world, so I'm very easy to find. Um, if you see someone who looks like me, it's probably just another gay. Um, we all Figure that like. out. Uh, <laughs> you see someone with Richard Fairgray written on their glasses, that's definitely me, or someone who's stolen my glasses. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm at Richard Fairgray on Twitter, and I'm on there a lot uh, in a lot of spaces, talking about comics and and you know yelling at people um, for being dumb and wrong on the internet. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm charming and fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so I, I will have all of those links and everything, and so you can go see uh, for yourself how how charming and fun Richard is on on Twitter and everything else. Um, so please go and check out those links. They'll be in the show notes. They'll be in the uh, video description if you're watching us on YouTube. Um, but once again, Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate you. No problem at all. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you so much again for tuning into the show. Uh, if you don't mind, please hit that like button, the share button, the notification bell. Uh, let's get this uh, word out about Haunted Hill and all the stuff that Richard's doing. Uh, and also, don't forget, once again, that we have that upcoming uh, script comic script writing contest. That's through Dream Foundry, and we're sponsoring that. You can find links in the show notes and in the video description uh, for more details. But uh, just as a reminder, that's a $1,000 top prize for the winner. And we have some celebrity guest judges that we'll be announcing here later. And there's other prizes from, from some other uh, big companies. So uh, please keep an eye out for all of that. And we'll see you on the next one.